over to you. Okay. Well, Russ, thanks for having me. Um, as you guys know, my name is Drew Best, Andrew Best, and I'm here in Amherst, Massachusetts, USA, and uh, kind of fun to be talking to someone on the other side of the world. So we're going to talk, um, going to talk about the evolutionary perspective on human sweating today, because that's what I can offer. Everyone watching this video probably knows more than I do about the physiology of sweating and certainly the physiology of exercise. And uh, I dabble in those things. I'm a runner and mountain biker, so those are my hobbies. But uh, it's kind of fun to moonlight sometimes as a quasi-physiologist, but I'm really not a physiologist. I'm more of an evolutionary physiologist. Mm -hmm. So this will be an evolutionary perspective today. So um, Russ, if you're ready, uh, I'll get the PowerPoint going. Sounds good. Okay. Um, share screen. Okay. Very good. And slideshow. We're all learning how to use this new technology, right? Okay. Russ, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Cool. All right. So um, I am stationed actually in a primatology lab at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, the only person in the lab who studies human primates as opposed to monkeys and apes. And what I want to talk about today um, is an evolutionary perspective on human sweating, how we think it evolved. <coughs> we'll look at um, sweating in our primate relatives um, and we'll conjecture a bit about how we think sweating evolved in the human lineage and why that was so important. So there is a bit of a thesis to this talk today. <clears throat> so real quick, um, how did I get here? Why, am, why have I become kind of the sweating guy? I didn't really see that coming. Well, for 14 years, I've been a high school biology teacher. I teach ninth grade science. Um, and at a certain point, I decided we needed to be teaching more human evolution. Actually, most states in the United States do not mandate that we teach human evolution. Um, that's sort of a special product of our, uh, you know, we are a Judeo-Christian nation, really a Christian nation, right? And so uh, probably because of that, human evolution does not make it into most of the teaching standards. And I think that's a total travesty. So I developed a unit on human evolution for my ninth graders. Um, and in the process there, I came across a paper by um, Dennis Bramble and Dan Lieberman, um, where they suggested that human running is actually adaptive and that our ancestors, maybe two million years ago, used running as a survival tool. <coughs> and I'm a runner, and so that was obviously a uh, very exciting to me and I thought, oh my goodness, there's, there's a reason why I like to run. There's a reason why we're good at it. And so I began to incorporate that into this high school unit. Um, you know, some evidence uh, as to um, humans seem to be evolved to run, right? So <clears throat> in the process of doing this, I realized I actually wanted to become a scientist and I wanted to study human evolution, uh, more specifically human evolutionary physiology, right? So why is our physiology shaped the way it is? What, what happened in the last couple million years in the evolution of our, of our genus, especially, um, that shaped us to work the way we work? And that led me um, sort of circuitously, uh, well, Russ, you know, when you're getting a PhD, you have to focus fairly narrowly. And while my general questions center on the evolution of running and endurance biology in our genus, uh, I focused more on heat and I thought, okay, so our ancestors were evolving in a hot climate. They were moving a lot, generating a lot of heat. Um, sweating must have been very important to our genes. And of course, I'm not the first person to, to realize that, but uh, not very many people have really investigated this um, to its fullest extent. So there was a bit of a space for me. And so I decided with the help of uh, Dan Lieberman from Harvard um, and my advisor, uh, Jason Campbell are at UMass, uh, that I should study the evolution of sweat gland density. So simply the number of sweat glands people have. Uh, why did we evolve to have so many sweat glands and why was that so important to the evolution of the human lineage? So <clears throat> through this route, <clears throat> I came to be the human sweating guy. So here's my thesis for this talk today. Um, I wanna argue that all the things that really make us human, so ask any paleoanthropologist, um, you know, what, what makes a human a human? What are the big things that happened during our evolution that really shaped us? Uh, I wanna argue that all of them were dependent in part on our ability to sweat. So sweating is this really underappreciated milestone in human evolution. So what makes us human? Well, being a biped, right? Walking or running, standing on two legs. 
um, foraging for food in open, hot environments, um, big brains, and these things kind of go in order, by the way, as we see, and culture and language, and all, all of these human evolutionary milestones actually depended on sweating um, for reasons that we'll see. If you can't cool off in this environment, then really none of these things are possible. So what I want to talk about today really are five things, um, and we'll start with how unique and effective is human sweating. And as my audience here are physiologists or sports physiologists, this will not be very surprising to you. <coughs> so heat um, really does present the challenge to life. Now, as mammals, um, heat can be a very good thing, right? Um, you know, the fact that mammals are endothermic and can produce their own body heat uh, as a byproduct of cell metabolism means that we can survive in different environments. We can regulate our temperature very efficiently, but um, it also means we're at risk of overheating in many different situations. So cell chemistry really requires a narrow temperature regulation, right? So this is why, um, this is why overheating or being very cold are both very dangerous. It's at the level of the cell that this matters. Uh, so all the chemistry happening in your cells um, really requires a very specific temperature range because the enzymes that drive all that chemistry uh, really only work uh, when it's warm, not cold, not hot, right? Uh, too hot and the enzymes denature and they can't bind with their substrates, et cetera, right? So thinking back to your high school chemistry. Um, <clears throat> And this chemistry in cells is also actually very inefficient and it produces lots of heat as a byproduct and that happens at several different points uh, in the energetic chain. So we'll start with, uh, you know, when you're converting the food that you eat into ATP, um, there are really big energy losses there uh, and those losses occur as heat. And then using that ATP um, to perform cell work, such as, you know, even like mechanical work, actually, especially mechanical work, muscular work, there are further losses there. So um, heat is a byproduct of the cell chemistry, right? And if you can't get rid of it, uh, it poses really big problems. <clears throat> so given that, you might expect that lots of animals have ways of cooling off really, really well. Uh, well, there are other ways to cool other than sweating. You know, most mammals use things such as panting, where there's some evaporation happening in the mouth and that can cool you. Um, but sweating really is the best way to cool off, but surprisingly few animals do it. So I've got here a, an evolutionary tree uh, really showing all of animal life. And the red squares here show the only groups of animals uh, who can sweat and only some of them in those groups actually can sweat. So sweating is actually very rare in spite of how good it is. Now, this is a really big evolutionary tree. It's not fair for me to show you this. You can't see what's going on. So let's zoom in. Um, just on our little area of the, of the animal evolutionary tree. And you can see that some members of the group comprised of horses, camels, and sheep, they can sweat. So horses and camels do sweat to cool. They actually use the kind of sweat glands that we have in our armpits and groin, they're called apocrine sweat glands. And um, and our bodies, they are confined to those regions. Um, but in these mammals and horses, um, they, the, those sweat glands spread to the rest of the body. It's an example of convergent evolution. You know, um, animals that move a lot really need to cool off. And so sweating was a good strategy, but they actually co-opted the other kind of sweat gland. And those sweat glands developed in those animals into uh, cooling devices, basically, right? In our bodies, uh, the African sweat glands are still associated only with the groin and armpits, and they produce oils and scents, and they may still be involved in, um, in odor production, things like that. <clears throat> but can you see my uh, cursor when I point? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay, so in primates, and we're going to launch into primates in a minute, um, the story is a little bit different. Some groups of primates... Uh, did evolve to sweat to cool, but they used a different kind of sweat gland called the eccrine sweat gland, which are found in most mammals only on the hands and feet. Okay, so we'll get to those. So sweating is very unique. In spite of how good it is, most animals don't do it. <clears throat> so basic sweat gland biology. Um, humans, there's a lot of variation I'm finding, but humans have roughly 2 million sweat glands covering their body. They're all over your body, all over your skin. They spread everywhere. 
these are the eccrine sweat glands, okay? These are different from the ones in your groin and armpits. Um, they're about three to five millimeters deep into your skin. And they have, well, starting deeper, uh, there's a coiled portion where the sweat is actually produced and a duct. The sweat travels up the duct um, and emerges onto the skin. <clears throat> and as probably many of you in the audience here know, the way that sweating actually works is there's a network of blood vessels uh, reaching the skin and during exercise or any kind of thermal stress, those blood vessels open up and blood flow increases to the skin um, and that carries heat with it. So as the skin gets hotter, it drives the evaporation of sweat that has been you know, dumped out onto the skin. Um, and as that sweat evaporates, it takes that heat from the skin with it. So in this indirect way, sweating cools the blood and therefore your whole body, right? <clears throat> Now, uh, this would actually be way more effective if every animal that sweated just had their own bucket of water all the time, and you could just dump water on yourself, that'd be even better. But since you know animals did not evolve to carry buckets of water, we have to put water on our own skin from within. So sweating is sort of inefficient in that you lose a lot of body water, but the whole point is just to get water onto the skin, and this is the only way that we can do it other than you know jumping in a pool or something. So sweating is very effective, right? Um, we know that we humans, let's talk about humans now, we do get better um, at cooling off. And um, some of you guys may have seen a better study than this because I feel like I'm talking to the experts on you know, human exercise physiology here, but I chose this graphic. <clears throat> um, so long story short, after two weeks of heat acclimation, so uh, doing endurance exercise in the heat is the most effective way to get full heat acclimation. Um, lots of changes happen in the body. There's a lot of plasticity. Um, and I just really quickly need to move my face out of the way. There we go. So um, after just a couple days, you get increased sweat rate. So your body is basically saying, okay, this idiot is going to continue to get hot. Uh, we had better start sweating sooner and we better start sweating more. Um, interestingly, one of the ways, maybe the main way, that humans sweat more is our individual sweat glands get bigger. They actually hypertrophy, uh, much like a muscle cell does. So one of the ways a muscle cell can generate more force is by getting bigger. Same with sweat glands. Uh, individual sweat glands, it seems like, can at least double in size, maybe triple in size, um, due to heat training. Um, this only works if you have increased blood volume, because if you're going to be sweating more, you need more body water. And we do see that's one of the first thing that happens actually with heat acclimation. Um, and this increases your exercise capacity in the heat. So basically it's buffering against uh, this water loss that happens with more sweating. So you have a lower exercise heart rate. And um, one other really interesting thing that happens is you have a metabolic adaptation where your uh, basal metabolism actually slows down a bit. Um, your body is basically saying, again, this idiot is gonna to continue to get hot, even though it's hot out, uh, it would make sense for us to just lower our overall um, heat production in the first place. So we actually have a lower core body temperature after acclimation. So um, the extent to which these things are true in other sweating animals, like other primates, I don't think anyone really knows. There is definitely some heat acclimation with primates closely related to us. Whether humans are better at it, I'm not sure. <clears throat> So let's look at primates. I'm going to bring my face back here if I can. There we are. Um, let's look at our closest relatives, the other primates, um, to start getting at um, you know, the roots of human sweating. Right? So first of all, why am I even talking about sweating in primates? Come on, Drew. I thought this was a talk about sweating in humans. Well, for anyone who doesn't study primates, really the reason why we look at primates for any question related to human evolution um, is that they're a really good model for telling us about how we evolved, right? So looking, looking at our closest relatives, even though we did not evolve from them, we did not evolve from chimps, um, seeing how we've evolved to be different from them, we can sort of work backwards and infer uh, what happened during our evolution. So, and again, we did not evolve from chimps, we shared a common ancestor, I wanna dispel that, um, sorry. Um, so, but if we go back, um, this has actually moved back a bit now, uh, probably seven to nine million years ago, we have a common ancestor with chimpanzees, right? 
so when we talk about human evolution, we're talking about all the species that lived on this branch. Okay, but for now, let's let's look at other living primates and let's see how they swim. <clears throat> so on the left here, um, this is a cladogram, or it's actually a phylogeny showing um, many different existing primate species. And this is from an analysis um, that Dr. Jason Camelar and I did in 2018, based on data from the 60s and 70s by a bunch of researchers. Um, it's been updated a little bit, but basically we can see that humans, uh, almost all of the glands in our skin are eccrine sweat glands. Uh, and our closest relatives, half to two thirds of the glands in their skin are sweat glands. But as you get more distantly um, into our evolutionary cousins, really, uh, we see that they have less and less sweat glands. And actually this whole group here, all of these primates who are not very closely related to us, uh, actually don't have any eccrine sweat glands. So how did that evolve? Um, so these, I don't really want to call them more primitive primates because they exist now. Um, but these are called the strepsorine primates. These are your lemurs and lorises, things like this. Um, and they, like other mammals, only have that green sweat glands on their hands and feet. And they don't use them to cool. This is a primitive mammal trait. And actually those sweat glands are linked with the fight or flight response as they are in all mammals and still in humans, right? So when you get nervous, your hands and feet sweat, that's a very primitive response. And we think it's to aid with gripping. If your hands and feet get a little bit wet in a moment of fear and panic, you have a little bit more traction to run for your life. Um, and so all mammals have that trait. And so this group of primates, the strepsorines, are just like other mammals. They only have eccrine sweat glands on their hands and feet. Great. So they can't sweat to cool. Right. But this group of primates, so this would be um, the African apes, right? Here we are. So well, the African and the Asian apes and the African monkeys. So this whole group here is called catarines. Somewhere during their evolution, somewhere in one of these basal catarine primates, um, eccrine sweat glands spread over the whole body and were used in thermal sweating, right? And there's not enough research on sweating in modern primates, but um, there's some anecdotal, well, it's not anecdotal, there's some inferential evidence that chimpanzees do sweat in response to thermal stress. Um, most of this really comes from Westling et al. 2018, really cool study. They they looked at chimps living in marginal environments in Africa um, during periods of drought and food shortages, and they found that chimps living in hot, uh, food-scarce environments did suffer from thermal stress and dehydration stress. So you can infer that they're sweating more uh, as they're thermally stressed, and they are using that to cool, much like we do, right? So when and how do these things evolve? So this is a similar chart to the last one, just kind of flipped. Uh, it's a cladogram showing the evolution of all current primate groups, going all the way back to the first primate, I don't know, 90 million years ago or something. But uh, So as I said, eccrine sweat glands on the hands and feet uh, is a primitive trait that evolved in mammals, I don't know, 200 million years ago, some, some fairly early mammals, because all mammals have that trait, right? And in primates, that didn't change until the catarine primates, maybe around 40 million years ago here, where those eccrine sweat glands spread over the rest of the body. Um, was that immediately useful for cooling? I think probably, um, but as is the case with really every new trait that pops up, it happens, it's, it's random at first, and then if it's good, it takes off, right? Um, around 20 million years ago, in, in apes, we see the next really important shift, which is that um, hair follicle density starts to go way down. Right, so monkeys here have a lot more hairs per square centimeter than apes do. So apes look just as hairy as monkeys, but they're not, we're not, right? And that's indirectly related to sweating in that sweating is much more efficient if you're not covered in hair. So I'm not saying that that's why hair, hair follicle density decreased, it may have been, but it certainly would have made sweating more effective in apes than it was in monkeys. And Somewhere in the human lineage here, fairly recently, um, we diverged even further in terms of our sweating. And we didn't actually lose, I'll actually start with this, we didn't lose any more hair, at least not number of hairs. So humans appear to be much less hairy than other apes, like chimps and gorillas, 
not because we have lower hair follicle density, we don't. It's that our hairs are much thinner and much shorter, and some of them are microscopic. So we didn't, so we, that, that's really how we lost hair, right? Thinner and shorter, but not fewer. But importantly, huge increase in eccrine sweat gland density, right? So looking at humans versus modern apes, we have 10 times more sweat glands per unit area than other apes do. So this does not happen by accident. Humans were definitely, um, there was a selective pressure to sweat more, okay? So looking one last time at modern primates, um, we used some very old data and ran some evolutionary modeling to try to figure out um, why, you know, why is there some variation in the sweat gland biology of living primates? So what we found um, is that, so basically these researchers in the 60s and 70s um, did histochemical and histological analyses of individual sweat glands from living primate species. And they kind of stopped there. They cataloged all this diversity, right? So they said, okay, certain primate species have more glycogen, right? More fuel stored in their sweat glands. Um, and some of them have more capillaries feeding their sweat glands, right? So here's a sweat gland. No surprise, every sweat gland has its own capillary cage. It needs a blood supply so that it can, you know, get glucose and um, oxygen to power active transport, which produces sweat. Uh, it needs water to make sweat, whatever. And what we did is we compared, we did two things. We did a phylogenetic analysis where we said, okay, are these differences in sweat gland attributes between living species, do they, are they what you'd expect based on how closely related they are? Or is there more diversity than you'd expect based on relatedness? And we also looked at climate. Long story short, we found that living primate species who live in hot, dry climates tend to have more glycogen in their sweat glands and more blood vessels feeding them. Um, now this is limited a bit by the quality of data we were working with, but this suggests um, that natural selection actually produced these responses in living primate species who presumably needed to sweat more because they were in hot, dry climates. Why not hot, wet climates? Maybe because in a really moist climate, sweating doesn't work very well, right? So we interpreted this as tentative evidence that natural selection has actually worked at the individual gland level. Uh, even in primates who don't have a ton of sweat glands, their individual sweat glands have gotten better at sweating based on the environment, right? Okay. So let's talk about human evolution finally. That's the point of the talk, right? So um, sweating was important really in a couple different stages of human evolution. And the first thing it probably helped us do is forage for food. So let's talk about hominins. Um, a hominin really is any ape that evolved after the split between the human and chimpanzee lineages. So a hominin is any ape on this line here, okay? And this should actually be moved back to about seven to nine million years ago. Uh, now, they're not all our direct ancestors um, because evolution is almost never a straight line. It's, it produces very bushy trees. But as we'll see, hominins are basically upright walking apes who, some of whom eventually evolved into us. So let's look at them. <clears throat> if you've never seen them before, this is a good reconstruction, uh, fairly recent presumably fairly accurate. Uh, these are many of the hominin species who existed over the last uh, six or seven million years. And you see that up in the top right, uh, here's humans, and some of them look a lot like us, but some of them really just look like apes who walk upright, right? So one of the points here is that hominins, um, in, in hominin evolution, human characteristics did not evolve all at once. We were not inevitable, we were not the end product. Um, there were lots of species who all lived and some of them were very, very successful. And in some ways it's kind of an accident and very fortunate that, that we showed up at all. So what do hominins have in common? Well, they're all apes, they're a subgroup of apes, but they do all walk upright. Um, so one of the first things that we see six or seven million years ago is that some apes begin walking upright. So let's start there with those early hominins. Here's a recent human evolutionary family tree showing many of the species that science knows. And I'm gonna use this a couple times here. 
Um, we're gonna start here. These are the oldest hominins that we know of. So again, hominin just means an ape walking upright part of the time um, and is on the human branch as opposed to a branch that leads to chimps, okay? Um, so the earliest hominins, things like Archipithecus, here's a reconstruction there on the top right, um, six and a half, maybe to four and a half million years ago. Uh, I'm gonna call this emergent bipedalism. They could walk upright, uh, but they were still spending a lot of time in the trees. Um, so some of their leg and hip adaptations were becoming uh, better bipeds, but their feet, for example, still had a divergent big toe, much like a chimp or a gorilla. Um, so they were definitely still climbing. So they were very ape-like. We think that much like modern apes, they had a fruit and plant diet, which means they probably had low physical activity and short daily travel distance. So apes today are actually fairly physically inactive animals. Um, humans are much more physically active than apes are. And that's because apes tend to eat just a handful of things that you can find in one area. And so they don't have to travel to find food except um, during periods of uh, you know, drought or whatever. But generally, they don't have to travel very far. All their food is right there. And so these early hominins were probably very ape-like, low physical activity, right? They were living ape lives. And they were fairly small, as many apes are. So these are really just apes who walk upright a little bit. So we don't really have any reason to believe that human-like sweating was evolving yet. Now, they were apes, so they had lower hair density, well, thinner hairs and shorter hairs than monkeys. Um, and they did have sweat glands on their whole body surface, probably because other apes do. So I'm gonna guess they could sweat about as well as a chimp can, right? So it gets, this story gets a little more interesting with uh, the next phase of hominin evolution here. And we have enough of them, a couple hundred individuals, um, fossils, uh, that we know that they're their own genus with several species. They're called Australopithecus. They show up around four million years ago and they exist until about a million years ago. So they were very successful um, in terms of how long they existed. Their way of life was more successful than ours has been so far. They were around a lot longer than we have been. So what's the deal with them? Uh, there's a modest increase in brain size, but they're still very ape-like in terms of their brains. But importantly, um, they probably had a dietary shift. They're eating a tougher plant diet, seeds, tubers, stems, the kinds of things that modern apes only eat during periods of drought and you know, hardship. Um, and so this, this probably means that they're covering a little bit more ground to find food, and that becomes important because in a hot environment, covering more ground means you're probably gonna have to sweat more. They could still climb, so from the waist up, they were ape-like, but from the waist down, uh, they were very efficient bipeds. They were becoming very human-like in their ability to cover distance efficiently. So, oops. Um, so they're probably getting a little bit sweatier, and here's why. Um, Dan Lieberman's idea is that, here we go, let's put the whole thing up here. Um, so, well, it's a lot of people's ideas. Um, even just looking at the picture, you can tell that hominins like Australopithecus really had no natural defenses, much as we don't either. So uh, we know that hominins were being eaten as food um, by, you know, big cats and other African carnivores. Um, we can, you know, we can see that in fossils, their tooth marks and their bones and stuff. Um, so being a biped trades speed for endurance, right? They had more endurance, but they were very, very slow. And that's true, as you guys know, for modern humans. I mean, even Usain Bolt could not outrun could not out sprint anything that wants to eat you. So whenever I, I give a talk like this, like why did running evolve? Someone in the audience always says, uh, so we could run away from predators. Go try to run away from something that wants to eat you. Anything that wants to eat you is gonna catch you. I don't care how fast you are. We are crappy sprinters, we have good endurance. So how would hominins have adjusted for this? One possible way is by foraging in the middle of the day, right? So. In Africa and other hot environments, most predators are not active in the middle of the day because they don't have really good ways to cool down, right? Um, they don't sweat. They can only pant and panting for reasons we won't get into doesn't work very well if you're galloping, right? So running fast and panting don't really go together. So four-legged animals tend to have to stop and seek shade and pant and they can't just you know, do a steady pace for hours in the heat. So if hominins like Australopithecus were foraging in the middle of the day, 
they would be avoiding predation. But that, that, that really amplifies the pressure to cool off better. If you're covering more ground in 100 and something degree heat, you'd really better be able to sweat. So we think that sweating probably really got going with Australopithecus. Um, and we presume based on our, um, our data, well, based on our analysis of some living primates that gland level adaptations probably evolved first, right? So we don't think that Australopithecus had a ton of sweat glands. Their sweat gland density may still have been ape-like. So, you know, up to 10 times less than ours. That's what other apes have now. But um, individual glands could have, you know, gotten bigger, could have had more glycogen, more capillaries. Um, and that could be an evolutionary genetic adaptation. Um, it could be phenotypic plasticity, right? We're just sweating more, makes your glands bigger, all the things that happen in humans. But either way, um, they were probably sweating more, right? And with that, you had to have less body hair. Right, so at a certain point, <clears throat> if you want to become a really good sweater, hominins had to lose body hair. Um, and we don't know exactly when that happened because just like sweat glands, um, body hair doesn't fossilize. So the stuff we're talking about here, almost everything in this talk really is, uh, you can't look at fossils to get direct evidence for it. So we have to infer. So we can look at lice. And at least two different studies have done this, have used lice um, as a clue to figure out when body hair was reduced and you know, linked with that, maybe when sweating got more efficient. Um, and last time I gave this talk, I got this wrong, so we'll try not to get it wrong this time. Um, there are two, maybe three different types of louse that live on the human body. There's certainly one on the head and there's one in the pubic region. Um, and one of those two, I believe it's the pubic louse, we actually picked up from, from gorillas. Um, and looking at the divergence times or estimating the divergence times between these different species of lice, we can figure out when they must have colonized different parts of the human body, right? So uh, when did we pick up um, the pubic louse from the gorilla site? Um, and two different groups did this analysis and they came up with two different answers. So one group said, okay, um, we picked up, you know, uh, two different types of louse um, around three million years ago. So that must have been when the middle of our body was no longer hairy. So as soon as you have two different types of louse, that means there's a big hairless barrier. So they said hair loss began around three million years ago. Another group did the same analysis and said it was more like two million years ago. So it was either with Australopithecus or with our genus, genus Homo, that hair loss really took off and that would have made sweating much more efficient. Right. So let's talk about the human genus. Um, Sweating helped our genus become fully human. How did that happen? <clears throat> so let's revisit my first claim, which is that all these things that make us human, right? All these human evolutionary milestones depend on sweating. Let's see if that's true. So let's look at the top part of this evolutionary tree now, genus Homo. And real quick, some, some things we know about the evolution of our genus. Um, we finally see bigger brains. Oh yeah, it's probably more like three million years ago. There's some older evidence now that genus Homo might be that old. Uh, but we definitely see bigger brains, bigger bodies, um, hunting, scavenging, and gathering. So we have evidence that um, uh, you know, there are cut marks on bones. So humans are definitely starting to eat meat if, if they hadn't already, um, maybe even hunting, and we'll get to that. Increased social intelligence, increased physical activity. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that the climate is drying out even more. So back in the time of the first hominins, they were probably still evolving in rainforest. But by the time of Australopithecus, um, Eastern and Southern Africa had shifted from rainforest more to a savanna environment. And that shift uh, continued during genus Homo. So we're evolving in a climate very different from other apes, right? Food is more spread out and the environment is hot and dry. Okay, so what's sweating got to do with this? Now, I probably shouldn't have said that because actually we're gonna take a little sidebar and look at some diversity in, in genus Homo. Um, so here are four different hominin, sp or, uh, hominin species in genus Homo, um, and they're four, they're four of the most different ones. Um, and I show you this because two of these are fairly new discoveries especially Homo naledi. So the more that we find, we're realizing that genus Homo was really bushy 
and evolution was tinkering with all these different body plans and strategies. And even in genus Homo, um, you know, the evolution to Homo sapiens was anything but a straight line. Um, so for example, Homo naledi, which has been recently dated to like 300,000 years ago, that's pretty recent. It has this weird amalgam of primitive and modern traits, right? So genus Homo is not on a straight line to us. Um, and even Homo erectus, who we'll talk about in a minute, they're the best candidate for, you know, first of all, being a human ancestor. They probably led to us. Um, but they're also the best candidate for the first really good sweaters, runners, long distance walkers. But there's even diversity in them, all right? So when they left Africa about 1.7, 1.8 million years ago, they left Africa with a ton of diversity. Um, these five uh, individuals lived at the same time in the same place, we think, in, in, in Western Asia. And they had incredibly different traits. Um, they were all, you know, different mixes of modern and primitive. So when I'm saying genus Homo evolved to sweat and did this, that, and the other, uh, some groups of them, but every, every species and maybe even every population of genus Homo seems to be evolving in different directions, right? So keeping that in mind, let's look at Homo erectus, right? On the right here, um, this is an African population of Homo erectus 1.7 million years ago, and compare that to its predecessor, Australopithecus, um, and we see that their bodies are getting bigger, their brains are getting bigger, um, and they're developing all these adaptations for much more efficient bipedalism. So while Australopithecus, um, from the waist down, is a pretty efficient biped, Homo erectus is way better. Arms are getting shorter, uh, the pelvis has reached its pretty much human-like shape where the muscles are totally oriented on the side of the hip, you know, the abductors, um, adductors, sorry. Um, and we've got expanded surface area in the acetabulum here, right in the hip joint and the knee joint and a fully modern foot and longer legs. And so Homo erectus was a long distance walker and maybe a runner, right? Um, sorry. So Homo erectus by 1.8 million years ago, finally we're seeing something very human. Right, so other than the brain, which was half to two thirds the size of a human, from the neck down, this thing is human, right? So if sweating and increased physical activity, uh, this is probably where it was, right? Um, and also around this time, while well, the climate in Africa had been changing for millions of years and shifting from rainforest to open woodlands and savanna, uh, there's evidence that there's also really rapid climate change and seasonality happening in Africa at this time, especially East and South Africa. And so there's cooler, more variable climate and it's drier and more variable and the vegetation appears to be more open, right? So it's more of a savanna environment. And this is important because in a period of climate change like this, um, you better be really adaptable and able to find food. It's much harder to find food in a really unpredictable environment like this. So we think that this climate change drove the evolution of our genus uh, further into becoming human, right? So food becomes more spread out, which means that Homo erectus probably um, had an increased daily travel distance. They had to travel farther to find food every day, right? So gone, way gone is the ape strategy of hanging out near a patch of fruit. That's been gone for two million years, but certainly by the time of Homo erectus, you've got to travel to find food, right? This leads to selection for more, even more efficient bipedalism and bigger bodies. Um, and this necessitates uh, really more calories. Um, but also, if you have the adaptations for covering ground more efficiently, and if you have the intelligence to, to find food in this much more challenging habitat, uh, all these things kind of co-evolve. You're, you're getting more calories and you can finally support a bigger brain. So really through this whole story I've been telling so far, brains haven't gotten that big, but with Homo erectus, they finally do. And we should ask ourselves, you know, if, if big brains are so good, why don't so many animals have them? And it's because they're expensive, right? It takes a lot of energy to maintain a big brain. And so to get big brains, you need all kinds of conditions to be right. And it seems with Homo erectus early in our genus, one and a half to two million years ago, all the conditions were right. They had to walk farther to find food right? They also had to be more intelligent to figure out how to navigate this new landscape and find food in it. And they're probably more cooperative, more socially intelligent. But as they're finding better and new food sources, um, 
that also lets the brains get bigger. So there's a selective pressure for bigger brains, but there's also the nutrition finally to support that. But all of this, so this really is what makes us human, right? This need to find food drives the evolution of bigger brains. But all of that increases thermal strain, right? So picture, you know, these ancestors walking, maybe running um, in probably the middle of the day in Savannah, Africa, and it's 100 and something degrees and sunny and dry. So sweating was already useful, but it becomes absolutely essential now. So I'm pretty sure that um, hair loss is, you know, happening at this point if it hasn't already. Uh, this is probably where we see greatly increased sweat gland density, because remember, humans have 10 times more sweat glands per unit area than other apes do, 10 times. So this tenfold increase had to happen somewhere, and I think it probably accelerated right around this time. And so it's happening uh, part and parcel with brains getting bigger and exploiting this new open habitat and being more physically active, right? So this begs the question, was Homo erectus a runner or just a walker? Well, we won't go through all of this, um, but there are some adaptations in the human body that, that seem like they're much more well-suited to running than they are just walking. And, you know, this can, be, uh, this can be kind of a weak argument to say, well, if it's not used in walking, then it must have evolved for running, but that's kind of where we're at now. But just a few examples, um, the Achilles tendon, uh, you need some kind of tissue there for walking, but you don't need this huge uh, energy storing and releasing tendon. Um, it's really only fully employed during running. Um, the power in our gluteus maximus, uh, you know, that's a muscle that's really only used walking uphill and running. But walking on flat ground, you don't even really need a glute. I mean, you need something there, but you don't need a glute like that. Um, and for me, actually, the amount of sweating that, that we can do and the amount of heat that we can dump is also evidence that we probably, at some point, our ancestors did, did rely upon running. Um, I mean, really, the only way to fully maximize your sweating response is to do some kind of endurance training in the heat. And there's really very few things you can do to sweat as much as, you know, running, cycling, doing some sustained exercise in the heat. So our sweating capacity seems matched to running. It seems way overbuilt for things like walking. Now, that's not a solid argument, so I'm not going to I'm not going to try to claim that it is. But for me, it feels kind of intuitive. So we may have been runners. Why? Probably to find food. Um, obviously running two million years ago would have been pretty silly. It's not something you do for fun, but some evidence from a couple of modern tribes um, shows that you can run down animals to death in the heat. Um, and there's a really interesting video that, did I link to it? No. Um, you can Google it, it's called Human Mammal, Human Hunter. It's a David Attenborough clip. Um, and it shows this persistence hunt here on the screen. I think it's from 2006, basically because most animals have to pant to cool off. If you keep them moving at a sustained moderate pace and don't let them rest and don't let them cool off, they will overheat. And so this guy here was able to walk up to this animal who was suffering heat stroke and was near death um, and you can kill it with a spear. Uh, and I've heard some anecdotal evidence from some people I know. Uh, you know, this one guy drove next to a kudu for half an hour in a truck at like 10 miles an hour. And that was enough to drive the animal into heat stroke and then got out and killed it with a rock. So if, you know, humans have this way of cooling while we run and other animals don't, we're the only predators who can hunt this way, right? Even the other animals, you know, most animals who hunt, they hunt by ambush. Um, uh, they don't use heat to their advantage the way we do. So it's possible that our ancestors were hunting this way because there is evidence of butchery and presumably hunting way before we had long range weapons like, like spears and stuff. Um, a little more evidence that we are sweaty endurance apes, right? So not necessarily that we're runners, but that sometime in our genus, we definitely evolved to be very physically active and have a lot of endurance. Um, if you look at chimps, oh, okay, so um, as you guys, I'm sure know, within any human muscle, um, we have at least, it's really a spectrum, but we have two distinct types of muscle fibers, right? We have ones that are better for strength, ones that are better for endurance. Um, but if we compare that with other apes, like chimps and gorillas, they have almost exclusively type one or um, fast twitch fibers, 
All right, they've almost exclusively fast twitch fibers. And human muscle has a preponderance of, oh, that's a ridiculous word. I'm sorry I just used that. <laughs> we, have, we have mostly um, slow twitch fibers, right? So there's further evidence that we've actually shifted to this more endurance type of physicality as opposed to strength. Now, of course, because we're apes, we do still have fast twitch muscle fibers and they do respond very well to training, as you guys know. And so uh, you can thank your ape ancestors for your gains. Those muscle fibers do hypertrophy in response to training, right? Um, now, on a similar note, um, what are we showing here? So human versus chimp muscle. Um, these, these researchers looked at uh, uh, metabolites, basically, um, metabolic intermediaries of molecules made during the metabolism in different cell types. And they found that um, in, in humans, since the last common ancestor of humans and chimps, um, human muscle metabolism has changed oops, eight times more than chimps has, right? So our muscles have changed eight times more than chimps has in terms of their metabolism. So there was a lot of evolution happening, uh, presumably to shift our muscles more to an endurance phenotype, right? And that is evidence of selection for an endurance phenotype as opposed to strength, right? So what about modern humans? Uh, what's the diversity in modern human sweat gland density? Well, we don't really know. That's what I'm studying. We know there's a lot of variation between individuals. So this is a pretty good review study here. Um, these are kind of average numbers of sweat glands you could find per square centimeter in different parts of the human body. Oops, excuse me. And as you can see, the hands and the forehead have a lot of them, but the rest of the body, it's all kind of similar. I'm finding, you know, the average might be 90 to 100 sweat glands per square centimeter on different parts of the body, slightly less on the legs, um, slightly more on the inner forearm. Um, and we want to know what, what causes this variation, right? Why is there variation between humans in this trait? Is it random? Is it due to natural selection? Um, one researcher thought that any variation that's there, and there is a lot of it, is due to phenotypic plasticity. So this is an old idea that um, you're born with a certain number of potential sweat glands, and that based on how often you use them as a small child or as an infant, some of them become active and some of them don't. And we'll get back to that. We're not even sure if that's true. So basically, we don't know. We don't really know what the diversity is in modern human sweat gland density. A handful of studies have looked at it with pretty small sample sizes. Um, my sample size will be about 100 when I'm done. I'm at about 65 or 70 right now. Still not huge, um, but we'll have a better idea hopefully when I'm done. So what causes this diversity? Well, it could be climate. So phenotypic plasticity, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, basically says regardless of what your genes are, um, environmental inputs will change how that how that trait uh, develops in an individual right so a great example of phenotypic plasticity is weightlifting if i lifted weights every day with my right arm my right arm would get bigger right my genes didn't change but the phenotype did so it's possible that actually living in a hot climate gives you more sweat glands if that's possible it's only possible when you're a little kid so we know that when you're born you have all the sweat glands you're ever going to have but they haven't fully matured um, the uh, nerve innervating them seems to flip phenotype and actually responds to a different type of neurotransmitter in the first, I don't know, weeks, months, maybe years of life. And so that presents the possibility then for phenotypic plasticity that maybe infants and small children in a hot climate who, who sweat more often, that might lead to the full activation to the full maturation of more sweat glands versus in a cooler climate. And there's some very preliminary evidence uh, supporting that from this guy Kuno, a uh, Japanese researcher in the 50s who came up with this hypothesis, but it really hasn't been very well tested. <clears throat> uh, it's actually limited to only three studies, um, but this is from Gray's Anatomy. Uh, somehow it's kind of gotten into, um, into the lexicon here, into the I'm gonna, I don't know, the zeitgeist, I'm thinking of other ridiculous words. Uh, people indigenous to warmer climates tend to have more sweat glands than those indigenous to cooler regions. We don't know that that's true. Um, there's a little bit of evidence to support that, and there's some evidence to refute that. So that's one of the things I'm looking at, right? 
So specifically, the questions that I'm asking in my dissertation research, um, does childhood climate explain variation in active sweat gland density? So that idea we just looked at. But number two, does geographic ancestry explain it? So maybe as humans left Africa, you know, as we entered different environments about 100,000 years ago, give or take, um, there, was prop, there was definitely different selective pressures um, for sweating biology. So maybe different groups of people in different parts of the world evolved genetically to have different numbers of sweat glands. Um, you know, I don't think it's, I mean, I think it's entirely possible that this happened. I think it's going to be very hard to detect, but we are looking at that. So one thing that we're doing is giving a 23andMe uh, genetic test kit to all of our uh, volunteers um, to try to correlate genetic ancestry with number of sweat glands and see if it explains it at all. Uh, so here's what we're doing. Um, we are, oh, here's me when I had a man bun. I, I cut my hair a year ago, but that's the fantastic man bun there. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, by the way, most of our volunteers are not shirtless. This is my friend. And so he was like, yeah, shirtless. Didn't make for a great picture. Basically, we're targeting six areas of the body and we're using the drug pilocarpine um, and administered via mild electricity called iontophoresis. And it makes the sweat glands in just one small area of your body sweat. It circumvents everything else. Doesn't matter what the temperature is in the room. It makes you sweat. And so every active sweat gland in that area will sweat. So I make an impression with a putty material. And then every hole corresponds to one sweat droplet, one sweat gland. We count them with a computer uh, and we have a good measure of how many sweat glands a person has. Right, so that's how we're asking these questions, by counting sweat glands in people from, you know, as many different environments as we can find. Um, some preliminary results, uh, I'm spending the next month analyzing the rest of my data. Um, I've run data on 53 individuals so far, mostly temperate climate people from the Northeast U.S. who grew up with air conditioning. And at this point, at that point, only 14 hot climate people who grew up in hot parts of the world without air conditioning. That number will go up hopefully to 30 or 40. Um, these were young people, median age 19.7. As you can see, the average gland densities that I'm finding line up with what other people have found, you know, just under 100 glands per square centimeter. Uh, and the variation between people in number of sweat glands is best explained by body surface area. So the bigger you are, the fewer sweat glands you have per square centimeter. So it kind of seems like everyone's born with a similar number of sweat glands, but people who grow to be bigger, <laughs> uh, their sweat glands just get farther spread apart. So that really is, um, that's the main covariate that we have to account for. So when we're looking at sweat gland density between people, we're not just looking at absolute numbers. We're saying, okay, do some people have more or less sweat glands than you'd expect based on their body surface area, right? So that's what this line is here. It's this density versus body surface area. So far, what are we finding? Um, age actually seems to be a factor. So the older people in my study, like us, people in our 30s have less sweat glands. I don't think that's gonna be a real finding once my sample size increases. Men have more sweat glands. Again, I'm very suspicious of that. And we're seeing a very slight and right now non-significant effect of temperature and water vapor, which is a proxy for humidity, right? So we're seeing people in hotter, drier places have more sweat glands than you'd expect based on their body surface area. But um, don't quote me on that. Um, that could disappear or it could even become significant as I analyze more data. Um, and that's what I just talked about, Rip. But um, what I think is more interesting, <clears throat> especially to you guys, is we, we need to know, does sweat gland density even matter, right? Um, does it matter at all? No one really knows. Well, it certainly matters across species, right? Oops. So we know that species that have more sweat glands can sweat better to cool, duh. So big differences in sweat gland density, they do matter. We also know from human exercise studies that the body's solution to needing to cool off more and needing to sweat more during exercise is to activate more sweat glands, right? So at first, when you start sweating, you uh, ramp up the sweat gland output uh, per sweat gland, right? So let's sweat more out of every gland. But then slowly, well, not even that slowly, after a few minutes of, of exercise in the heat, you start to recruit most or all of your sweat glands. So you don't use them all at once. Right, so you start to recruit them 
Um, and then sweat output per gland drops a bit because more glands are sweating. So the body's idea is if we need to sweat more, let's activate more glands. So yeah, more glands does matter. But it's possible that, um, you know, maybe the variation between humans and how many sweat glands we have is small enough that maybe all of us have enough sweat glands that we can coat our skin with sweat. So like, think of it this way, if 10 sweat glands in this area is enough to fully coat the skin with sweat, then 20 sweat glands wouldn't matter, right? Having, having 10 more sweat glands there, you can't overcoat your skin. Once your skin is coated in sweat, um, that should be all that matters. And so any increases in gland density above and beyond that won't make a difference. Uh, kind of just thinking about this idea recently, and I don't quite know how to test it, so that can be something in the future, but if we can determine how many sweat glands you need per unit area to, to fully coat the skin, that's gonna, be, that's gonna be the number at which any sweat glands beyond that doesn't matter. Interesting further research. So how are we asking this? Uh, we've framed the question as, what is the relationship between sweat gland density and ability to dissipate heat, right? So we are using a metabolic chamber. This is super fun. We're the first ones to use it on campus. We've got this million dollar machine and we're the first ones in there. It's awesome. An anthropologist is the first one in there. There's probably exercise by scientists all over campus. Uh, why, you know, why did the anthropologists get in there first? I'm probably making that up, but it's, it's fun to think. So um, for anyone who doesn't know, I bet a lot of you do, um, a metabolic chamber, basically we, we know um, a lot of things about the air flowing in. So we have the controlled flow rate, we know how much air is going in, we know the concentration of oxygen, CO2, and water, and we've set it to 30 degrees Celsius, nice and warm. And we're taking trained endurance athletes, runners mostly, um, and this is only during the summer, uh, so we know they're heat acclimated, and I'm making sure that all the athletes have done X number of hours of training in the heat, so they're all heat acclimated. Uh, now, importantly, we're not actually subjecting all of them to the same uh, heat acclimation protocol that seemed infeasible, that would be ideal, but they all live in the same area, they're all training in the same conditions, um, and I've, I've recorded how much they're training, so while I can't control it, I can at least account for it. So we want to see, do these heat trained people um, does the number of sweat glands they have actually have anything to do with how well they cool? Does it matter at all, right? So to do that, um, we had to modify the chamber a bit so that we could measure not only outflow oxygen and CO2, which tells us how much energy they're actually using, it's telling us metabolic rate, which we can convert to heat, right? Uh, but we also have to measure water vapor, so we know how much water they're driving off their skin. Um, and that, from that, we can work backwards and say, okay, if they got rid of, you know, X amount of water, uh, mostly through sweating, then they must have gotten rid of this much heat because it takes X amount of heat to drive X amount of sweat off the skin. So here we can calculate energy expenditure, heat production, and evaporative heat loss. Um, so we're going to know, hopefully by the end of this summer, if everything opens back up, um, whether sweat gland density actually has any effect at all on how well you can cool. And I think that um, the people in this study are the ones to tell us that. So I'll sort of end here. Um, I say sort of end here because I forget if I have more slides or not. Um, so this is an older study, but there's a more recent one that says basically the same thing. Um, we've adapted to heat before, and we have another challenge coming up uh, with uh, climate change and global warming. Um, certain tropical areas of the earth that right now are probably already near the upper temperature limit for what humans can live in without air conditioning are going to get hotter. Uh, and so, you know, certain areas on the planet are going to become potentially uninhabitable um, without air conditioning. And those are also the places that are often poor and don't have air conditioning. Um, so I think we can sustain an elevated body temperature for something like six hours before you get organ damage. Um, and you need to cool, and so this is going to be this is going to be the next challenge in you know human sweating evolution. I shouldn't say evolution because we're probably not going to adapt to this in terms of evolutionary adaptation. Mm. It's happening way too fast. It's going to have to be cultural adaptation. It's going to have to be medicine, air conditioning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so here's all the people I want to thank, but I also want to thank you, Russ, for having me. This has been fun to talk about. <clears throat> That's great. Thank you very much. Um, that's excellent that yeah a lot to think about and i think there's a lot of crossover really between um i think sort of the applied outcomes that we try and achieve with 
heat acclimation um or even i guess some of my work like in interventions for athletes competing and training in the heat um and just having an evolutionary understanding really helps you make sense of some of that um that's fascinating i've got a couple of quick questions and then um we'll try and do a yeah we'll try and do another session like q a session um as you suggested for our students um a big thing i guess as a exercise scientist and a nutritionist by trade we hear a lot of rubbish um particularly on social media at the moment are there any myths in your line of work like are there any myths around sweating myths around sweating um i wouldn't say it's a myth but there's a lot of confusion about the different types of sweating right so the kind of sweating that you're doing to cool is not the kind of sweating that makes you stinky right so like the sweat on most of your body surface really doesn't smell bad at all uh it's the sweat from under your armpits mostly that that smells which you do also have eccrine sweat glands there too and you do use them to cool but um uh so sweat does not necessarily stink i guess is one myth um let's see other myths ah maybe i'll come back to that in the q a i'll try to think of some cool um something you spoke about quite consistently throughout was this idea of like variation um and something it may be ties into uh, something that i found recently through my phd research um i don't know if you've come across any of this in terms of like thermoregulation and thermodetection um with the like transient receptor proteins that detect a, like a range of temperature i didn't know if um there's some quite nice work that's done recently which was great to hear that you're looking at 23 and me testing um for this so they looked at, at sort of genotype that then coded for those thermal detection proteins and showed an effect by latitude um so i'll send that paper through to you um, i wonder i wonder if you're going to maybe see something like that because really i guess sweating is an effect or a potential effect of stimulation of those proteins right um so it'd be interesting to see if yeah if that correlation does exist really and we can start looking across systems yeah i mean i think that's a bigger point um and you know so sweat glands are just one part of the of the whole system that the human body uses to cool right and they're probably the most immutable ones i would guess so it's probably unfortunate for me that i'm looking at the part of uh the machinery that is least likely to change right um it's these it's these these proteins like you're talking about and um and a lot of the links in the neurological chain that probably change more in response to heat acclimation and that may have changed as you were saying due to evolutionary pressures over the last tens or hundreds of thousands of years as humans live in different environments i think those those are more likely candidates for evolutionary variation between human populations the number of sweat glands are um you know i know for example with cold adaptation um there is some good evidence for um differential uncoupling proteins uh like across different populations right so i don't think they found it in skeletal muscle but definitely brown adipose tissue um i think uncoupling proteins one and maybe three are more highly expressed in um in the inuit i believe and that seems to be a genetic evolutionary adaptation so basically uh less efficient oxidative phosphorylation leading to more heat production and i think i've seen some evidence that those proteins are expressed less in people from hot climates um, i don't know if they really teased apart phenotypic versus genotypic differences there but that just speaks to your point that there's all these different links in the chain of how the body regulates temperature and sweat glands are probably the least likely to be responsive to um, to that uh, so there's always other things to look at, which I would like to at some point. So yes, please do sign that paper. Um, what else have we got? Yeah. Um, 
this is a pretty broad question, um, I guess, but in your line of thinking, um, what's next for our evolution? Like, how would we sweat better or do we need to? What's the, because I think almost looking at your, um, at the figure you showed where you had um, like gland activation and gland output, that reminded me a little bit of this trade off that we have between like VO2 max and running economy where ultimately mm. we, can, we can sort of operate at the same output just between individuals, it's going to look different. So it might be a higher percentage of VO2 max that we're operating at, or it might be that we're having to stretch that economy element a bit more. Um, okay. Do you think we'll see, you know, is that discussion apparent in your line of research as well, do you think, or do we need to move that way evolutionary speaking? I hate to do this, but I think I need you to rephrase the question. Like, do you mean, do you mean, um, are we discussing how human sweat biology may change? Yes, that's my, yeah, that was my main sort of point of the question. Well, okay. I should not speak for every biological anthropologist, but I'm going to try because you know, <laughs> I'm here. Um, I think the feeling is that because human culture is um, so advanced at this point, it's sort of, so obviously natural selection still happens, right? So. Um, anyone who has more offspring, uh, whatever genes they have are going to become more common, right? Um, so the only way for sweat gland biology to change in terms of an evolutionary change is if people with, a cert with certain sweat gland attributes have more or less offspring than people with other sweat gland attributes. Um, so sweat gland biology would have to have a direct effect on reproductive success right and i think in most parts of the world it doesn't just like having certain um like genetic disorders or i don't know like having to wear glasses or something or you know me my i sprain my ankles a lot when i run you know if uh that's not going to prevent me from having kids but maybe a million years ago it would have right so in a way we've we've drastically reduced or at least fundamentally changed the effect that natural selection has on us because of the way we live um, and the things that determine whether or not you know who has more uh, reproductive success I think are much more uh, in terms of social and interpersonal success as opposed to like physical vigor and uh, even things like immune function that probably used to be very important um, you know you can have a compromised immune system and still be a very successful person and have a lot of offspring. So that's the long answer to your question. I think the answer is no, I don't. I mean, will human sweat gland biology change? Sure, just as, as we continue to evolve, um, lots of things will change, but I think that other, I think that genetic drift and other random uh, evolutionary processes probably have a much bigger effect now than natural selection. So I don't think we're ever gonna get better at sweating is, is my short answer. Yeah, cool. That's, um, and I guess, yeah, to finish up, what's next for you? Like, what do you, yeah, where, where do you see your research going? Or is there another direction entirely that you want to take? I'm, I'm starting to think about those things. I'm, I mean, with, with, you know, the virus shutting things down, I'm maybe a year away now from actually defending and being done, even though I'm two thirds of the way through my data collections and I published part of it. And so, um, I don't know. I mean, I might stick to being the sweating guy. There's so many other avenues here to explore. Uh, I do have an interest in exercise physiology. Maybe I'll move a bit in that direction. Um, I'm most interested in evolutionary questions, but not just sweating, really anything to do with, you know, the physical nature of being human and how those things evolved. Uh, so why, why does the human body work the way that it does? I'm not giving you a very good answer. I don't know. I mean, I'm, well, you know, it's like nose to the grindstone, finish this project. Yeah. Um, and I feel like a lot of what comes next, I mean, even this project and the way that it's gone, it's all been serendipity. It's meeting certain people who ask you certain questions and give you certain opportunities. And so I, I don't think I can predict at all what comes next, which is kind of fun. No, that's cool. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking about this as you were speaking. I wonder if um, it might be nice to sort of get a working paper together around this idea of, 
because of the popularity of ultra running at the moment, yeah. we maybe need to look at that and say, well, are we evolutionary equipped to do this? And then what are the limits upon that? Um, oh, cool. So I think, yeah, there's something that we can maybe, given both our interests, we can write something quite cool in that space and that'd be um, pretty exciting. Because I think that the more would, yes. dig into things, there's maybe, there's always these safety mechanisms, but they always have um, a bit more capacity than we think they do. Uh, yes, yes. So yeah, it's a real interesting model, I guess, to study or pose some of those questions. Yeah, if you have a couple ideas for what that might look like, would you send them my way and I can ponder them? Yeah. And there's a, as a, as a resource for anyone watching, this is not a primary source, but if you've, uh, if you've read Endure um, by, uh, Oh, Alex uh, Hutchinson. Alex Hutchinson, yes, yes. That, um, there's some gems in there um, that really that, that whole book asked the question, what are the limits of human endurance? Are they mental or physical? And the answer is both. Uh, so yeah, we could explore that more specifically with ultra running. That would be fascinating. Great stuff. Right. I think if we um, sort of end the recording and the session here, that'd be fantastic. But thanks again for your time. Um, certainly keep in touch and uh, yeah, I look forward to getting our students questions to you and um, yeah, I'll get this video out to them as soon as possible and we can we can arrange that Q&A session. Sounds great. Look forward to it. Cheers. Thanks very much. Adios.